Swami Vivekananda <coughs> when he was here in New York. There's a beautiful description of him in one of those rented houses when he would teach meditation. That posture, this one, he would sit like this. And he said, now we will meditate. And he would sit. And the description is he would become like a stone Buddha, like a bronze image of the Buddha, You're absolutely still. And others would also sit, some on the carpet, some on, in, on chairs. There's even a description of people sitting on the sink because there was no place to sit. <laughs> it was so crowded, small rooms. And they would meditate. 15 minutes would pass and a half an hour would pass. And Swamiji absolutely motionless. He's lost in Samadhi. He meditates, he goes into Samadhi. 45 minutes and people are starting to fidget, look up and then close their eyes again. <laughs> one hour and one and a half hours and two hours. And people will gently get up and quietly slink away. <laughs> two, three hours later, he would open his eyes and his room would be empty. <laughs> He's made them all disappear. And he would be ashamed of these things. And you know, he would, he would try not to get so absorbed. In Thousand Island Park, I went there recently in St. Lawrence River, where he went and spent six months. That book, Inspired Talks, it was a, there was a cottage, there is this cottage, Miss Dutchess, Elizabeth Dutchess Cottage, and about 10, 12 people, they gathered, a dozen people actually, they gathered there, and Swami Vivekananda spent six months, uh, six weeks teaching them Vedanta, yoga. Mm. Why did I bring up Thousand Island Park? Yeah, the uh, meditation, meditation, meditation. Yes, on the rock. So he, once he went for a walk uh, outside and there's this, there's this oak tree. And he said, we shall now be like Buddha under the uh, bow tree, Bodhi tree. And he sat down to me meditate. I think Miss Josephine McLeod and somebody else was there at that time. Uh, Christine? Christine, yes. And a rainstorm, a squall came. Vivekananda, the description given is that he became like a bronze Buddha there, sitting there. And a squall came, rain and cold winds. It's, it's on top of a little hill, if you've seen it. And uh, the lady said, we tried our best to protect him with those parasols, the umbrellas, the, um, they put it over him. He didn't notice the shower which came and passed. He was absolutely still in meditation. So that's called the Vivekananda Rock now. If you go there, if you see, if you see that place, it's, there's a plaque there. This is one path, the path of yoga. And Swami Vivekananda was a master yogi. He wrote his classic Raja Yoga. That was the first book he... And he actually wrote it. it and it was... A, uh, it's, a com it's his commentary on the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. I think we have a few copies here. If you don't have it, you must uh, have a personal copy of that. That is the classic book of this path, the path of meditation, Raja Yoga. I think we have got a few copies here. He wrote it in New York. And the way he wrote it was he would sit and meditate. And who took down the notes? Ellen Miss. In, in New York, and she would sit with the pen, ready, dipped in ink. Because when he would start speaking, would come a perfect shower of eloquence. But he would sit in meditation. He would take up one of the sutras and meditate upon it, and then dictate. And she would take it down. And then he finally saw the proof, and it was published. So it was during his lifetime. There are copies of it signed by Vivekananda. I've seen a copy, which is given to others. This one and later on Karma Yoga, which is a compilation of his lectures on Karma Yoga. These two books. You know the author J.D. Salinger? He writes, these are two classics which I believe our modern American youth ought to carry around in their pockets. The two little classics of Vivekananda, Raja Yoga and Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga, do we have any copies here? Yes. So that is what might be called a progressive path. A progressive path is, do you notice when I talk about yoga, I give you clear instructions? 
how to say it and what to think where to pay attention you know what to do it is something to be done with your attention and you know what kind of mind you want to attain you also know more or less where you are wandering mind peaceful mind concentrated mind no i have to bring the mind back you know these things it might be frustrating sometimes when you are not able to concentrate but it's a known kind of frustration you know what to do about it so clear instructions and clear you know what to do where to go and uh, more or less where you are along the path all those things are more or less understood in this path this is the progressive path but you will notice when i talk about the insight path the path of Medi of of vedanta the path of knowledge i don't give you clear instructions i give you little stories examples because there is no other way of pointing it out language cannot express it there's no particular thing that you can do to get it it has to be approached elliptically i have to keep on pointing it out to you so that one gets it if you get it you get it it is unmistakable in the progressive path there is progress there is there is you advance sometimes you regress and you know where you are there is frustration and struggle in the in this path of knowledge one seems to be circling round and round and not getting anywhere particularly one seems to be where one began years ago gathering a lot of information and and philosophy and um you know metaphysics and epistemology but not really making any kind of change until the day it changes it all changes you get it you make the breakthrough once you make the breakthrough there is no going back swami vivekananda says in one place it's like a trick picture have you seen some of those pictures where it's like a mass of dots but somebody tells you there is a flower uh, um or i've seen a picture it's it's supposed to be shiva it just seems a mass of colored dots is shiva meditating and you stare hard at it you say i don't see anything just and suddenly it falls into place a trick picture have you seen some of those swami vivekananda says it's exactly like that once it falls into place you've got it so the way to approach it is indirectly that's why so many stories and examples one beautiful story which i want to share with, uh, share with you um, today is there are very wise stories of mulla nasruddin so mulla nasruddin what he would do he um, he was a trader and he would carry goods from one kingdom to the next kingdom and the border guards knew that he was smuggling that here comes the mulla with goods all sorts of things loaded on his um, uh, on this uh, donkey and he comes across and they check every item everything seems to be on above board but they know he's a smuggler he's doing something but they don't understand what and every time they check and all the goods are fine and they have to let him go go through and uh, many years later he retired and one day he met those border guards who had retired by that time and they sat down for a cup of tea and the guard said to mulla nasruddin you know i know what you are up to but i could never really get it what is it that you were smuggling and the mulla said donkeys <laughs> <laughs> it's right under our noses we don't notice it this awareness atman pure consciousness chaitanya is the donkeys smuggling donkeys always under our noses we don't notice it there is the story of uh, why we don't notice it is because of this another story there's a little boy who hadn't seen a movie so his father said i'll take you to the town and show you a cinema a movie a film and so they went on the way the father was telling the child you know what a movie is there will be a screen and there will be light playing on it and of course sound and you'll see pictures so they go into the movie hall and the movie has started and i love to think it must be mahabharat or something like that the movie has started and that's important because um, when we enter life the movie has started we don't see life at the beginning of the movie then it would be clear to us but we are thrust into it there is a world and there are parents and there is school to go to and to and the business of growing up and all of that is there so we get engrossed in the movie 
and the child also gets engrossed in this movie and gets completely involved watching it enjoying it but after some time he recalls his father had said that there is a screen on which the movie plays so he asks his dad dad where's the screen you you said there's a screen where's the screen and the dad and father says right there in front of you and imagine it's the i always say it's the scene of the gita bhagavad gita krishna teaching gita to arjuna in the middle of the battlefield there and the child says oh arjuna is is the screen no 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 right behind him oh krishna krishna is the screen no no behind them oh you mean the battlefield that's the screen no behind that oh the sky you mean the sky is the screen the sky behind the battlefield and the father says um no 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 all of that all of that and then the child says oh so you mean krishna and arjuna and the chariot and the battlefield and the sky all together that's the screen no 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 if you remove all that then that's the screen oh if you remove all that nothing so the screen is nothing how will the father point out the screen to the child because everywhere he points he knows what he's pointing towards but everywhere he points there is a picture what is this pure consciousness what is this brahman pure being it can be pointed out very easily when you know what but what you point to it's always covered with a name and form you say this is it or oh, you mean the bottle no 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 not the bottle <laughs> yeah. so everywhere it is there but it is covered by maya the, the screen of names and forms sri ramakrishna says in his very simple way he's sitting sitting on that little cot in dakshineshwar and he says you know what it is like here i am you see you can see me but he puts his little gamcha towel puts it in front of him so now you cannot see me and he removes it now you can see me <coughs> now what is that screen that is maya the name set in forms <clears throat> one way is <clears throat> let me give you another example the example of space is there in manhattan i noticed that in manhattan when it is cramped all these buildings and suddenly you come here get out of the car and you look out over the lake into the hills and the forests and the abundance of space so what you did not notice earlier suddenly you feel it <clears throat> the vastness of space all around it's like that it's ever present that awareness is ever there In fact one of the names given to it in Vedanta is chidakasha the sky of consciousness here is a mahakasha mahakasha is physical space this one where we are hmm and <clears throat> all of this we are experiencing in our minds thoughts feelings perceptions coming and going emotions that is called chittakasha the space of the mind or sky of the mind physical sky mental sky but all of those experiences are also happening in awareness that awareness sky chidakasha it's it's infinite in that arises chittakasha thoughts feelings perceptions and in those thoughts feelings perceptions you experience a physical world outside so chit uh, mahakasha the literally the great space meaning the physical space the universal space all of that is cognized in chittakasha mental space all of that is cognized in chidakasha the sky of consciousness what a beautiful term the sky of consciousness now it's difficult sometimes suppose someone does not understand what space is how will you make that person understand This here is space and so this person no 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 in between in between there's nothing 
So there is this uh, student who goes to a guru and who doesn't understand what, what space is. And the guru tries this way and that way to point it out, he doesn't understand. And the guru says, all right, you stay here. I will, I will help you. But what you do is, as long as you're staying in the ashram, do some work. Here is in front of the ashram, there's a little space. You, make a, you cultivate um, flowers, sunflowers. So this, this young man, he sows the seeds, he waters them. And he's staying in the ashram and studying with the guru to know what? What is sky? What is space? And after some time, the plants sprout and they began to germ, they began to grow, the saplings, they began to grow. And you know, sunflowers, they, they grow very tall. So it begins to grow and grow. And weeks pass and this, every day he tends to them, he loosens the soil, he puts water on them. And then the flowers begin to bloom. And it's quite thick. It's quite, they are quite tall. The whole bed of sunflowers in front of the ashram, covering the front of the ashram, it's all there. After some time, when the plants are fully grown and thick and large and covering uh, in the front of the ashram, the guru one day says, when the young man is going out to water them in the morning, he says, wait, today take this sickle and cut them. Cut them. Yes, cut them all. Just remove all of them. And so he starts cutting. And within a short time, he's done. Everything is cut down. And the guru says, see, space. He says, oh, I see. That is space. What, the, what was the method? It was covered up, filled up with something. But in order to remove it all. And then you get it. That is, this is called Adhyaropa Apavada. Superimposition, desuperimposition. Or Vivekananda calls it hypnotization, dehypnotization. We have already hypnotized. Half the work is done. We have grown the sunflowers. Now the thing is to cut it and appreciate the space in which they stand. How is it done? All Vedanta depends on this. One teacher said, Ye to Vedanta ka hai. This is the heart of Vedanta. This method of superimposing something only to remove it. For example, recently we have been studying in the Vedanta Society, Mandukya Upanishad. We took so much time to point out, who am I? Here I am, the waker, with the waker's body and mind, experiencing a waking world here. And then I fall asleep, I am the dreamer, experiencing a world of dreams. And then deep sleep, I am the deep sleeper, experiencing a blankness. And I wake up, now the real you. This is the cultivating the sunflowers. Now the real you. Who is the real you? You are not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper, not something in between. Huh? You are not something that can be seen, that can be heard, that can be smelt, tasted, touched. It's not something that can be grasped, that you can walk to. Do you remember the seventh mantra? Those who attended the class, we did it. Nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam na bhayata pragyam na pragyana ghanam na pragyam na pragyam. Adrishtam abhyavaharyam agrahyam alakshanam achintyam abhyapadeshyam. So, all negatives, cutting down the sunflowers. Till you realize what you are. Adhyaropa pavada, superimposition, desuperimposition. Or you take the way, method of this uh, Taittiri Upanishad. Today we chanted Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma, that's from Taittiri Upanishad. What is the method there? The method of the five sheets. Here, see, physical body. Hmm? Notice, physical body. Then the deep, go deeper, inward. What is the quest? Who am I really? Go inwards. The breath, prana. <sighs> go inwards. What is aware of the breath? The thought, mind. You must notice it yourself. Body I can demonstrate. <laughs> breath I can breathe heavily and can let you know that I'm breathing. But mind, unless you are a telepath, I can't demonstrate. But you know, the people are, there are telepaths. I have met a few. <laughs> Those are remarkable stories. I can maybe later on tonight I can share some different st interesting stories. There's this person I asked once. He had some powers, but I just wanted to see if they are tricks or not. And I pr gave him a simple test. I don't want any complicated thing. Just now, what am I thinking? Tell me. And he told me. 
It's a scary thought. <laughs> you can see straight to, into, into the... Sri Ramakrishna says, as in a glass case, you can see whatever is inside the glass case, I see through human beings. I see exactly what is inside, the stuffing inside the person. Mind. Notice the mind. Physical body, here. Breath. Subtler than that, inward than that, mind. You must notice it yourself. Thoughts, ideas. Subtler than that, inward than that, the understanding faculty, the intelligence which you are using for understanding all this. Subtler than that, inward to that, the bliss sheet, the sheet of complete restfulness, blankness, voidness. If you try to go beyond the Understanding, faculty of understanding, buddhi. Yeah. What is experiencing all of them? You are none of these. You are the one experiencing all of these. Annamaya kosha, body, here. Pranamaya kosha, the breath, which is part of the pranamaya kosha. Thoughts, thoughts inside, manomaya kosha, the faculty of understanding, vijnanamaya kosha, and the, we don't even think about that, we don't even notice it, what you experience in deep sleep, the anandamaya, the bliss sheet. This basically constitutes whatever we are aware about ourselves. And having presented all of this, the sunflowers, the Upanishad says, you are none of them. Why? They are all objects, clearly. They are things like this. This is a thing. This is another thing. This is another thing. Just like that, this is a thing. The breath inside, also a thing. Thing means an object to your awareness. The mind inside, thoughts, also a thing, subtle thing. The intellect in, beyond that and the bliss sheet, they are things, objects, subtler and subtler and subtlest, still not you. Then what are you? And there they will tell the story of the tenth man. Hmm? The one uh, they counted, they thought the, their friend was drowned in the river. And they counted, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the tenth man is drowned because they forgot, the person forgot to count himself each time. Until a wise person comes and says, count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the wise man turns his hand towards himself and says, thou art the tenth. Dashamas tuamasi, thou art the tenth. And he says, oh, I am the tenth. Why did the tenth man not count himself? Because he was looking outside. Why was he looking outside? Because all those nine, the first nine persons were outside. All that he has ever been used to is an object. So he is naturally, he is justified in thinking the tenth person, whatever he is looking for. Because whatever he has looked for in all his life has been an object. A physical object, a vital object like the prana, a mental object like a thought, memory, an intellectual object like an understanding, a conception, or just blankness. These are objects. But the one to whom they are objects, they are, that is not an object. That is the pure subject itself. So that tenth person, that is the one experiencing the other nine. That's why he was, he was looking outside. Because he is used to looking outside. He has found the other nine outside. So he expects the tenth one also will be outside. But the tenth one is not outside. The tenth one is he himself. Exactly like that. Yeah. Count. Cut down the sunflowers. The not body, not prana, not mind, not buddhi, not the, uh, the anandamaya, the bliss sheet, the blankness. Try to see. Yeah. You are the tenth man. You are the experiencer of the five sheets. What is that? Go deeper and deeper and deeper. Simply try this, try this technique. This is cutting down the sunflowers. And then you have to notice the sky. What is cutting down the sunflowers? Here is the body. It's an object. Think like this. Breathe in and breathe out. Not to follow the breath. Mind on your tummy. That's, that's the other path. This one is 
All right, I am aware of it. So the breath is an object. Then go deeper. So am I the mind? No, I am aware of thoughts also. So the mind is also an object, a very subtle object, but an object. Even the intellect which is trying to understand all this is also a process. I can feel it churning away, working away. It's an object. And when I go deeper, just hit a blankness. That's also an object. What am I? When you get it, you cannot objectify it. Be aware of what you are not and rest in what you are. I didn't coin that, by the way, but I, I found it, I liked it. Be aware of what you are not and rest in what you are. What you are, you cannot be aware of that. You can't objectify it. The tenth man cannot see himself outside. Correct? The tenth man can only recognize, I am this. Have you heard the story of the headless Shiva? The man who kept on searching for Shiva, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya all his life, could not find Shiva. And one day he was praying desperately to Shiva that I have searched all my life but you did not come. And, and in, at night he got a dream. Shiva appeared before him and said that, tomorrow I am going to come and meet you. Oh great! How will I recognize you? Look for the headless man. The next day he started looking. All have heads. <laughs> I can see only myself only up to this. Where is the head? Oh, I am the headless man. <laughs> ah, Shivoham. Again, it's a pointer. Back to yourself. This is cutting the sunflowers. All right, couple of distinctions now. I want you to understand the distinction between two terms. Yesterday Deepak asked a question, but that I want to bring up today. We keep talking about consciousness, awareness. A distinction has to be made here between Swarupa Jnana and Vritti Jnana. Let me write the terms and I'll explain it. Vritti Jnana Swarupa Jnana What is Vritti? You know it's Vritti is a movement of the mind. Mm -hmm. So Vritti Jnana. What is Vritti Jnana? It is consciousness plus mind. And what is Swarupa Jnana? It is consciousness itself. In Sanskrit, Vritti Jnana means the knowledge made possible with the help of Vrittis. I'll re re uh, repeat. The knowledge made possible with the help of Vrittis. That is Vritti Jnana. Example, everything that you have known, even now. So you are seeing something. When you see me and the pen in my hand, what is happening is, the I see it, and it creates a vritti in the mind of the form, I am seeing this Swami with a pen. Uh, seeing vritti, it's called darshana vritti. And that vritti in the mind is lit up by the ever-present consciousness, you the consciousness. That lights up. In fact, none of this is theory. Every bit of it you can actually match with your experience. That is vritti jnana. My words go to your ears as sound, and then it sets up, this, it is transmitted by the ears, auditory nerves to the brain and from there on to the mind and it sets up a vritti in the mind, a movement in the mind, sound, speech, words, meaning, recollection, understanding, all of these are vrittis going on in the mind right now. It's happening very fast. That's a vritti and it's automatically lit up by the consciousness shining in the mind. Pure consciousness, reflected in the mind, lights up whatever vritti is there in the mind. 
Pure consciousness is reflected in the mind, captured by the mind, channelized by the mind. Don't get stuck up on words. It is called reflected consciousness. There is a term, chidabhasa. Shadow consciousness or reflected consciousness. Reflected consciousness is a good term. What is it? Very simple. It's the consciousness you feel right now. Not the thought, the awareness that we feel. Don't we feel that we are aware beings, sentient beings? That awareness which we feel is not in itself the pure consciousness. It is the reflected consciousness. The consciousness reflected in the mind. It exists as long as the mind is functioning. See, it, it disappears. When you feel dull, you don't feel so aware. It's not a problem with awareness. It's a problem with the mind. Take a cup of coffee, you feel aware again. It's the mind which is shiny. Uh, fall asleep, that awareness, that reflected consciousness is gone. Pure consciousness is not gone. Where is the pure consciousness now? And if you knew it, then you, that would be the end of the retreat for you. <laughs> it is, how do I put it? It is just behind, underneath. That, that reflected consciousness. It's a very inadequate way of putting it. So this is called vritti jnana. Darshana vritti, the vritti of seeing, enables you to see. Consciousness illumines that. Shravana vritti, the vritti of hearing, enables you to hear and understand. Consciousness illumines that. The moment consciousness illumines it, you get the experience, the first person experience. Vritti by itself is not enough. It's just a movement in the mind. It has to be lit up by consciousness. And that lighting up is not an action. It's always there. Consciousness is ever present. What changes is the vritti. Consciousness constant, vrittis change very fast. It is a stream. So what is called stream of consciousness in literature is actually stream of vritti, technically. Because consciousness is not a stream. Consciousness is continuous. Yes. Yes. I feel I can make this leap with grace. Is there any place in Yana for this concept of grace? It is. In um, Katha Upanishad, for example, there is a um, mantra. It says, Whoever it chooses, that one gets it. Yame Vesha Vrinute Tasyesha Atma Vivrunute Tanum Swam. The one who Yes? The one who, who, whom it, it chooses, that one gets it. Immediately, the dualistic interpretation is very, very straight. Oh, the, to one to which it is graceful, you get it. But that, is, that creates problems for Shankara. So, immediately he gets down to work. He, he is like, this won't do. You are messing up philosophy. So, well, what does he do? He says... He asks, you see, the delicate movement. Um, he asks, whom does it choose? That's a quick, good question. Whom does it choose? And his answer is beautiful. He says, whoever chooses it. <laughs> you have to choose it. You think, I am this jiva, this sentient being. I'm trying to understand my real nature as if it's different from me. Fine. Think that it's different from me. It's not. That is the error that has to be removed. I choose it. I choose it means I want to know it. That is the purpose of my life. I am a spiritual seeker. Who are you? I am a spiritual seeker. What do you do? I go to retreats. <laughs> that is choosing. That is, that, is, that, is, that is what is called choosing. And one day we will get it. Who will get it? We will get it. Yes. Whoever chooses it will get it. The one it chooses will get it. But then whom will it choose? The one who chooses it. How do you choose it? Because you have to want it. Not only put it on your to-do list, and 2018 to-do list, and by the time December 2018 comes, oh, I didn't follow up on that. Not that kind of to-do list. Actually, my whole purpose. Who are you? I'm a spiritual seeker. You don't have to put on this dress to be a spiritual seeker. All of us here are spiritual seekers. Our definition of ourselves should be that. You could be a housewife, you could be a professional, you could be a monk, whatever. That's your external thing. Arjuna was a warrior. Krishna was a coward. Yeah. But um, each of us, are, we are spiritual seekers. You just have to own up to it. That Ultimately, that's my purpose in life. Yeah. 
What is Swarupa Jnana? Swarupa means, Swa means own, Rupa, nature, form. My own nature, knowledge. Jnana, knowledge. Knowledge, awareness. So Vritti Jnana is that, that knowledge which I get through Vrittis. What, where is consciousness? Consciousness must be there. It is prior to all Vrittis. Consciousness is prior to all Vrittis. Vrittis come and go, consciousness does not go. Consciousness makes Vritti Jnana possible. Consciousness makes Vritti Jnana possible. There is a fantastic verse which Vivekananda was so f uh, fond of quoting. Tameva bhantam manubhati sarvam. That shining, everything else shines. That shining. Everything else shines. Tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light, everything is lit up. By its light, everything is lit up. By its light, everything means all the vrittis are lit up. What is it in itself? Pure awareness, swarupa jnana. When is it? All the time. All the time. Who are you? You are this one. Swarupa jnana. Remember, those, for, those who know Sanskrit, swarupa jnana is not jnana about the swarupa. Your Swarupa itself is Jnana. Swarupa means your own nature. I, me, myself, what am I? Equal to Jnana. Jnana means awareness here. Your Swarupa is Jnana. Two questions, I think two hands were up. Who was there? Yes. Uh, so you said to say, Swamiji, uh, the Vritti Jnana is the same as the truth, and the Swarupa Jnana is Yes, object. you can put it that way. Somebody else had raised a hand? No. Yes. Yes. Swarupa Jnana is not Jnana about the Swarupa. It is you, the real Swarupa, the real nature. It is pure consciousness. It is what is called Satchidananda. There are different names for it. Chit, consciousness, pure consciousness. Chaitanya, pure consciousness. Samvit, Chiti, the feminine form of it, pure consciousness. Uh, in, the, in Buddhism, it is called pure mind or natural mind. It's called the clear light of the void. It's called the Buddha nature. Yes. Purest form of what? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Don't make that mistake. Vritti is a movement in the mind. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, perceptions. Perceptions, they are all vrittis in the mind. Whatever you can see inside, what you can see on the outside, the public thing, physical. This is, vritti simply means a modification. If I raise my hand, it's a vritti of the body. So this is technically called chitta vritti, movement of the mind. Vritti means modification, any modification. I move my hand, it's a vritti of the hand. Movements in the mind. Thoughts, emotions, mind is used in a very general sense here. Includes intellect, ego. Ego is a special chitta vritti. The I, operation of the I. So all of these are vrittis. And they are not you. This just an, an instrument, an app. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yes. Can you explain what that I is? Um... The I, the ego. Right now if you feel the I, it is called this I. I mean the vertical I. It's the ego. In Sanskrit, ahankara. It is clearly a vritti, a movement of the mind. If you think I, it's there. If you don't think, it's not there. It, 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 if you notice it, it, it comes up. It's an activity of the inner instrument called the antakkarana. What it does is, it, it has a particular function. It's in fact defined in, in Vedanta. Abhimanatmika antakkarana vritti ahankara. The abhimanatmika, which means, how do I translate? Abhiman means that which collects everything, which unites everything as I, me, mine. I am this person, it is my thought, my memory, my body, my problems. Which all the activities of this body and mind are integrated by this activity called I. And Vedanta, and that's what we take ourselves to be, all the time. It's natural, it's, it's a function of the mind. It's meant to do that. What Vedanta tells us is you are not it. 
it's also an object. You want to see? Greg Good's method, yeah. He's a psychologist working, very, very much influenced. In fact, he started studying Vedanta with Adi Shwaranji in, in, in the New York East Side Center. He told me, huh? Greg, long time ago, in the 1970s, Greg Good, uh, G-O-O-D-E, he's in New York. I had some email correspondence with him. So he, uh, he does counseling and all of that. So he gives this simple method. What he does is, you just sit straight. Now, imagine, what are we going to look at? We are going to see the real eye and its relation with this one. Draw a line mentally, a parallel line, um, a horizontal line through the waist mentally. And now think, feel right now, feel the eye. I, I, Sarva Priyananda, where do I feel it? Approximately. Do you feel it below the waist or above the waist? Everybody will generally say yes. Some, whatever it is, it's above the waist. There are very few. It will be a very odd person who says, I feel my ego in the knee. <laughs> you can feel the knee, especially if you have a knee problem, but you don't feel I am the knee. And this is me. No. All right, above the waist. Now draw one more line. Um, horizontal, mentally, through about this place, like the solar plexus, horizontal to the ground. Now, where do I feel the eye? Do I feel the eye below this or above this? Above. Most people will say above. Now draw one more line. <laughs> Headless. Headless. Headless Shiva. Draw it to the, like a neck parallel to the ground. Do I feel the eye, not theoretically, notice it. Do I feel it may not be even be precise, but vaguely. Do I feel I, if we're forced to choose, below the neck or above the neck? Above. Most people will say above. There's some people might say below, here in the chest. Some people might say. That's all right also, whatever it is. Suppose you feel it above. You feel it somewhere in the head. Most people will say. Now draw two lines. One vertical line like this, like this, and one more like this. Dividing the head mentally into three parts. One part here, one part here, one part in between. The sense of I now, delicately. Where can you feel it, locate it, approximately? If I'm forcing you to choose, this side, that side, in between somewhere? In between somewhere. Many people would say that. Maybe. I mean, in between. Some might even say right eye. Some people actually say. Doesn't matter. In between somewhere, just behind the forehead, just behind the eyes, some, some people might say. Focus on that. <coughs> you feel it there, somewhere. Now, clearly, you feel it. It's an object. What is feeling that thing? What is feeling that I sense behind the eyes, behind the forehead? You can never catch, catch it. Remember that formula. Be aware of what you are not. Rest in what you are. That which you feel between the eyebrows or behind the forehead, that is the ego, ahankara. It's a function of the mind. It can, be, it can be clearly objectified to this extent, that you can actually locate it as a feeling. And there are very simple reasons why you feel it there. Because most of the senses are heavily located in the face, in the head. The ears, the eyes, the nose, the tongue, and the skin is very sensitive, multiple muscles and all. So a presence of that reflected consciousness is very strong in the head region. And very naturally you, you associate your presence there. That presence there in the head, that's the ego. The one which is aware of it, that's the real I, the real you. You can never catch it. Whatever you catch will be an object. That ego is shining in your light, in the light of the Atman. All the time. If you notice it, it will come up, it will start become awake and, and say, yes, I'm doing Vedanta, yes, yes, I'm, I'm on the job. No, it is not. 
It's not on the job. It doesn't do anything. Yes. It goes like a ping pong. You know? Yes, like a ping pong. Correct. Where is the pong? Ping the pong. Ah. <laughs> it is the ping pong. It goes like that. But you are not the ping pong. You are not going like that. Follow this. Follow this. Ah. Watch this. One, somebody showed a very good idea I, I got from, uh, he said, see, it's, our mind is like, suppose you're teaching somebody to drive on a rainy day like this. And he said, switch on the windshield wiper. And the windshield, you have to watch this. The windshield wiper comes on. And this guy who's learning to drive, he goes like this. <laughs> you say, hey, keep your eyes on the road. He said, okay. And the windshield wiper comes no, keep your eyes on the road, on the road. Okay. What you're supposed to do is this. Not. This is the mind. And we, we keep following it. Whatever it does, we dance along with it. Like this. No. You are different from this. Let it do. Ping pong. Mm. It takes a little effort because you are hypnotized, we have habituated into. Remember that. That is the mind. Let it do its work. Um, does Vedanta try to take this I and point it to consciousness or does it leave? Okay, the very good. No, you are right. This I has two parts Aham, Kara. It points to consciousness. The ahankara, the ego, has two parts. It's also a vritti. See, any vritti has two parts. It is the mind, but it's also lit up by consciousness. It is irradiated, lit up by consciousness. So any vritti can be used to point back towards consciousness. Most of all, this I vritti. This is usually what it does is, is here is consciousness, plus here is mind, plus here is body, and here is the external world, a flower maybe or something. And what this I Ritti does is, it usually points to body mind. But Vedanta says this one is actually pure consciousness, this one. The I you will have to see who the, when you say, find out who am I, then you say, the I which naturally points to body mind, you have to see that it is not actually body mind, it points to uh, pure consciousness. That is the whole project of, that is the whole project of Vedanta. No, it's there. <coughs> if you say that I am not the windshield wiper, does it stop working? No, it will let it go on working. Why do you have to do this? Let it go on working. You, the pure consciousness, you don't have to do anything. It is always there. It is stable, steady, and shining. It is perfectly, it is a flawless peace. Completely undisturbed and undisturbable. If you think you are disturbed, it is something in the mind or the body. Now this, this I is continuously identified with mind and body. We are trying to show, see that how it points to pure consciousness. The real I is none other than the pure consciousness. And the ego, which, which it will go on working as body-mind, but it points to real, pure consciousness. You know that the real I is, I am this, but in day-to-day -day activity, the I will continue to work as with, with the body-mind. So, in Panchadashi, who am I? This I, the ego, this one. There are three meanings. In Panchadashi it says there are three meanings. One, two, three. The I has three meanings. One meaning is for the unenlightened. What does it mean? Body-mind. What does I mean? Body-mind. We are firmly convinced I am this. We are convinced about it, we don't question it, we behave as if I am this, and we speak as if I am this, and that's it. There's nothing more to it any more than that. And so all my life, my whole concern is with this body-mind, how to make this body-mind better, how to protect it, 
uh, how to save it, how to enrich it, and so on. This is the, this is the unenlightened state. That's, how, that's where we are. The enlightened person uses the word I in two senses. Two senses. One is the primary meaning of the word I, and one is the secondary meaning. This is all I. When the enlightened person says I, it doesn't mean this. What that enlightened person means by I is pure consciousness, this one. That's the primary thing. If you ask that enlightened person, who are you really? <coughs> Aham Brahmasmi, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. That, that's, that's a fact. Whether that enlightened person tells you or not, that person is completely convinced about that. There's no doubt about it. That is the primary meaning of the word I. But the enlightened person also uses the word I in a secondary sense. That's the third meaning of the word I. That is body-mind again. But this body-mind in a secondary sense. In what sense? Only in a transactional sense. Only for dealing with us and dealing with the issues of life. Sri Ramakrishna, he would slip up sometimes. Sometimes he would say, Ami jal khabo, I will drink water. And sometimes he would say, this one, Ekhanka. Uh, once he worshipped this picture of his. He says, one day it will be worshipped, ghare ghare puja habe, it will be worshipped in, in houses across the world, he said one day. And he offered flowers at the, to this picture. As if this thing, it's a very holy thing. But for him, he's using the word I in a secondary sense then. When he says, I will eat, I will go, this is hurting. All this has tremendous impact on our, our life. When um, Hari Maharaj, Hari comes and Sri Ramakrishna is suffering, dying from cancer, terrible pain. A doctor told me that it's one of the worst forms of cancer. <coughs> Very messy and terrible and, and a lot of suffering and discomfort. He's dying. And Hari comes and asks, how are you today, sir? And he says weakly, Sri Ramakrishna says weakly, um, I can't eat and there's pain here. And Hari says to him, but sir, I see that you are in bliss. That's a, that's a cruel thing to say to a person dying of cancer. And what is Sri Ramakrishna's reaction? He bursts out laughing and he says, oh, the rascal has caught me out, has found me out. <laughs> what does that mean? It means when he's saying, I, it hurts and I, it is uncomfortable and I'm in pain. Is he lying? No, it's true in this sense. You are beyond it all, it's really nothing to you. Yes, that's true, in this sense. Both are true, yes. All right, so in the number one yeah. and the number three, yeah. you are using I instead of body. Body-mind, yes. The difference when the enlightened person uses the number three is because he's, when he's using the number three, he's still perfectly aware of the number three. Correct. No, aware means he knows. <laughs> Example? A person who is acting, it's an actor suppose, you act as a king or a pauper or a beggar or a soldier in a drama. Now when I act as a king in a drama or, or a soldier in a drama, I know I, I will act like that soldier, speak like that, give the dialogues, behave like that. All the time I know I am this actor. I am this actor. And I don't have to keep reminding myself in case I forget. <laughs> I am Sarva Priyananda, I am Sarva Priyananda. <laughs> Morning one hour, Sarva Priyananda, Sarva Priyananda, Sarva Priyananda. <laughs> Evening one hour, Sarva Priyananda. Otherwise I might forget. Hmm? Never. You don't do that. You don't do that. You see how silly it sounds. But many people think, at the very least I have to hold on to this. This becomes a big problem. When you begin to get it, that I am the witness consciousness, this becomes the number one question. How can I hold, this is great, how can I hold on to it? How can I hold on to it? I seem to be losing it. I'm losing it in both senses. <laughs> can, can I, how can I make it permanent? It is permanent. What is not permanent is the thinking going on in that mind. And that will never be permanent. Don't worry about it, relax. I'll tell you a very inspiring incident which happened. There was a very great teacher, Ramananda Saraswati, I sometimes mention him. He passed away a few years ago. He was, he was a wandering monk, but he was regarded as one of the recent Jivan Muktas, enlightened while living. 
If you're doing this, you know that you are pure consciousness and you behave as body and mind, you know secondarily, then you are a Jeevan Mukta, enlightened while living. Once we were sitting, it happened in front of me, we were sitting a group of monks and some other devotees in Haridwar and the Swami was sitting up there on the stage and one young monk was questioning and very good Vedanta questions. And at the last question was, but at least we must hold on to that awareness, Aham Brahmasmi. We must hold on to that, Aham Brahmasmi, that much we must have. Mindful of it. Mindful. That is, you see, that's the first path, the progressive path. I must be aware, like holding on to the awareness of the belly expanding. We must hold on to the awareness that I am Brahman. And look, listen to Ramananji's response. I'll tell you in Hindi and then translate. Immediately he said, stunning response. Vahi to nahi karna hai. That is what you must not do. If you do it, that is, that is the ignorance that ties you to the body-mind. You're still using the mind yeah. to sustain what the mind is presenting before you as enlightenment. Mind not necessary. Your own name. Your own name. You don't put any, any effort towards reminding it. To, to, to remember it. Do you do japa of your name? Sarvapriya and Sarvapriya in the morning, Sarvapriya in the evening. No. Somebody calls, Swami. I say, yes. Or do I look around? So, Swami, who is there? <laughs> oh, me. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, I don't do that. Immediate. Immediately, Swami. Even when I'm dozing, Swami, you're sleeping. Ah, oh, Swami. <laughs> now, this name is something, it's a conventional thing. It has been imprinted on my mind just a few years ago. See how powerful it is. And that consciousness, which is behind that mind also, once you realize that, there is no chance of forgetting it. I'm telling you, once you walk through that gate, if you don't do a single day sadhana after that also, you'll never lose it. It will be instantaneously available to you all the time. But don't stop doing sadhana. <laughs> sadhana is for the mind. If you do hatha yoga, for the body. Sadhana, if you do prayer and meditation and concentration and dwelling in that awareness, that's for the mind. The mind becomes more and more accustomed to thinking of itself as reality, this one. Really, this one. Not this way. I'll come to you. The gentleman back there. Yes, you. Yes. Of course, all the time, whatever we are doing, even now, the fact is, everything is done by pure consciousness. Actually, nothing is done by body-mind. It's an interesting thing. My body is doing it, my mind is doing it. Actually, no. I, the awareness, am doing it through the body-mind. It is pure consciousness speaking through body-mind. Always. How is that possible? Think about it this way. When you say, when I say, I am happy, I am happy. I'm saying it now. I am happy. What actually said it? The tongue. The lungs. The vocal cords. They said, I am happy. But what's happy? The tongue. It's the mind which is happy. The mind is using the tongue to express, I am happy. Exactly in the same way, pure consciousness uses a mind to formulate the thought, Aham Brahmasmi. I am pure consciousness. Because that's the function of the mind, to think. It's not the function of pure consciousness. Yes. What's the relationship between number two with the pure consciousness with my neighbor's pure consciousness? It is one and the same. Good question. Two questions I'll take up before ending. 12.30 is lunch, right? It's good it was lunch at 12.30 because then we could extend this. Two questions. One is, what is the relationship between my consciousness and that person and my neighbor's consciousness? The question is, this witness consciousness, how many of them are around? 60? You have, you, have read, you, you, have read too, you have read too much Vedanta. You immediately said one. But if you ask Sankhya, they will say as many sentient beings, so many pure consciousnesses. Yoga, they'll say, as many sentient beings, so many pure consciousness. If you ask Vedanta, one. One. 
Why? Why do you think it's one? Why do you think it's different? Ah, because of the conditioning of the body, because of the conditioning of the mind. Clearly bodies are different. Here, you can count 60. Clearly minds are different. With the thoughts in your mind, the experiences, the memories, the personality you have, she does not have. What she has, I don't have. They're different. What differentiates consciousness? What, what justifies you in asking this question, how many consciousnesses? Because you see so many bodies. You know that the minds are different, persons are different, clear. That is understood and admitted. But consciousness itself is not different. Yes, that's the person, that's the body. Yeah, clearly. The body, the light shining through. Imagine a big pot with many holes. From outside you will see many beams of light coming through if there's a lamp inside that pot. But the source is one. There are not many. Uh, which one? Is it a whole or a part? No. If you say that we all have parts of pure consciousness and there's a whole pure consciousness that is Vishishtadvaita. You're on the right track. It's Vishishtadvaita, qualified monism of Ramanuja. Whole and part. We are parts of a, of a divine whole. This universe is an organic unity and that unity, it's an organic unity, it's not an identity. The body is an organic unity. Legs and belly and hand and uh, head and ears and eyes, they're all parts, but they're all different from each other. They're all parts of an organic unity. This is Vishishta Advaita, not Advaita. What does Advaita say? In consciousness, there is no part and whole. Akhandam. Akhandam means undivided. Let's put it this way. There is only one consciousness and that's you and you are, the, you are all of it. You are all of it. There is no other, than, uh, no other consciousness apart from you. Krishna says in the, in the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, hold your questions. I will not take any more now, but after lunch again. In the Bhagavad Gita, he says, 13th chapter, he says, this body is a field and in this body, you, Arjuna, you. You are the knower of this field. You know it from inside. Now the question arises, clearly there are so many fields. How many knowers of the field are there? Ultimately, minds of course are many. That's also part of the field. Krishna says in the next verse, Kshetragyam chapimam vidhi sarvakshetre shubharata Know me alone to be the knower of the field in all the fields. Two questions have been answered here. What are the two questions? How many consciousnesses? One. What is God? What is God? We are talking about religion. We haven't mentioned God till now. What is God? It is that one knower in all beings. In every being of the universe, whoever has existed from beginningless time, it's that one knower. And Krishna says, I am that. If this, this direct path is too much, you can stop here and say, I worship and surrender that to that one. That is... Here is the path of devotion. Branch off your exit to the path of devotion. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you care for your safety, take this exit. If you miss this exit, you are in trouble. Because what remains after this is very serious stuff. <laughs> yes, that is one question. So there's one consciousness, according to Vedanta, shining through many bodies and minds. Your neighbor is a different body, different mind, but you and your neighbor are one as far as that awareness is concerned. We are all one being. Not brothers and sisters, literally one being. And the second question I wanted to uh, just touch upon here. All beings, all awareness. Plants, animals, everything. What is a plant? Different body. What's an animal? A different body. Wherever consciousness is reflected. And what are non-living things? What are the bodies and things like this? They are appearances of that one consciousness alone. With different names and forms. Alright. One more point I'll quickly mention. But it's a very deep point. I mentioned what is our ordinary knowledge. Vritti Jnana. What is pure consciousness? The real self. Swarupa Jnana. Then what is Enlightenment. The term used is Brahma Jnana or Atma Jnana. Atma Jnana is 
self knowledge self realization it is a special type of vritti jnana a special type of vritti jnana it also happens in the mind there's a lot to be known about that but it will require a full lecture what exactly happens in enlightenment but know that it is necessary because the question might come if i am always this swarupa jnana if i am always this pure consciousness what more needs to be done what needs to be done is you have to awaken to that that nature somebody is a young man who was poor and somebody left him a rich uncle left him you know proverbial rich uncle left him a million dollars so now he's a millionaire but he's still on welfare and you say what happened to you he says i have heard that i'm a millionaire but i don't know where the money is it doesn't pay my bills just to know that i'm a millionaire to pay the bills i have to get that money similarly that this uh, pure consciousness we have to know it as we have to actually recognize it and that recognition happens in the mind we have a deep error in the mind we think we are body mind what vedanta does i'll repeat this what vedanta does precisely and i am translating from shankaracharya only what does vedanta do somebody asked him if you are brahman then what is vedanta doing you are already brahman if you have to go to heaven i know this is the way if you attain samadhi here is the way to meditate but if you are already brahman then what is vedanta doing so what vedanta does is this it cures or it corrects the error that i am not brahman all that vedanta is trying to do is to correct the deep seated error that i am not brahman i am not aware that i am this pure consciousness the very existence of this i am not aware of it is veiled from me and being veiled from me it shines upon body and mind and i take it this body mind i am this is why i am why here it is revealed this is me this is what is happening and vedanta corrects this error i never was body mind but i am convinced that i am body mind this conviction has to be changed and convi- and that pure awareness which is right here shining through my awareness of body mind it's that same awareness this one has to be isolated understood in isolation as my real nature then come back to the business of living no problem at all that is enlightenment brahma jnana it's called atma jnana self awareness i'm coming to you that self is also brahman the ultimate reality of the universe that's why it's called brahma jnana also one uh, one additional thing i wanted to say about this all right ask the questions so if i am deeply brahman self or think that i am i am the pure consciousness yes swarupa jnana is oh swarupa jnana is always there whether you note it or not if you continuously point towards it if you keep on noting that i am it it will ultimately culminate in brahma jnana in your vritti jnana in your mind so what is the difference between swarupa jnana and brahma ah swarupa jnana is consciousness is awareness it's always there it's there right now it it never changes Brahma jnana is that special moment of enlightenment that aha moment which comes in the mind wipes out the error that i am body mind and reveals my nature to me in its full glory it will happen once but it will be permanent for you once you walk through that gate you you've got it you don't have to repeat. You, you you will you will feel like staying in it but it will never go away for you but that breakthrough is instantaneous and sudden once no 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 swarupa jnana is pure consciousness awareness always there satchidanand the brahman it is the ultimate reality swarupa means your nature yes Oh, it's not at all like being in a coma. Are you in a coma right now? No. After enlightenment, you can be just like this. You can talk, walk, eat. You can sing. You can dance. You can fight. You can quarrel if you want to. Yes. Oh, that is nirvikalpa samadhi. If you remain absorbed in that, in that awareness, 
if you use that progressive path which we did just now in the, in the, in the morning and in, in the beginning of the meditation as you become more and more focused what are you doing there you're shutting out the world you're you're not moving around you're not opening your eyes you're not thinking of anything else only the breath as you go deeper and deeper the attention becomes focused like a uh, flame in a windless place doesn't flicker no other thought will come then you thought that then you drop that also that breath you're aware of the breath you drop that also no thought at all absolutely serene that is samadhi yoga chitta vritti nirodha that's a special state of the mind nirvikalpa samadhi and gyanis attain it when you realize that you are brahman what will happen is why nirvikalpa samadhi is sometimes associated with gyana tota puri did it sri ram krishna did it you clearly realize you are not the mind and you don't need the mind and so the tendency is to drop the mind you realize it is not no thought this is a very beautiful verse in the yoga vashishta the gyani tells the mind what you can tell me what you can do for me i'm not interested and what i am interested in it in is beyond you so keep quiet <laughs> so the mind oh <laughs> <laughs> nothing that the mind can do is of any interest to me no i'll tell you vedanta no what vedanta will you tell me i am brahman which vedanta speaks about it's the mind trick the moment you say vedanta the mind will be say vedanta okay let me listen to vedanta all right vedanta then the mind will say all right now lunch it will pull you towards that <laughs> all right wait no no let me put it. we'll do it on our way to lunch om shanti 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 hari om tat sat श्रीराम कृष्णारूपणमस्तु